joined now by Camille Ray, uh, who is the mother of her trans son, Leon, um, who has been uh, outspoken about uh, her family's decision to, to leave Texas. Um, Camille, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate you opening up and speaking about your family's experience. Thank you for having me. So uh, let's just start there. Um, I mean, we've been covering the hundreds and hundreds of anti-LGBTQ, anti-trans bills throughout the country um, that uh, just in this calendar year. And Texas passed a trans uh, gender affirming care ban for minors back in May. So your your family had to make a really tough decision. Um, what what led you to this moment? Well, it it really wasn't tough in the moment, <laughs> in a way, because it was so obvious that we and our rights were in danger that it made it very easy to decide to leave because that's not the environment I wanted to raise my child in, and it's not um, where I felt I could be a parent that I could make. Uh, the best medical decisions for my child. If I couldn't do that, why would I stay? So in that sense, it was easy. Uh, and still, though, I mean, it's it's a massive upheaval. And I mean, I, I you spoke in your Daily Beast interview a bit about how you saw this coming as other states were beginning to pass their own gender affirming transition care bans, uh, particularly for minors, That's but not exclusively. Sorry, go on. No, I was going to say, that's right. I grew up in Texas. I know what the politics is like. And when I saw that Arkansas was the first state to pass such a ban, I knew that that was going to happen in Texas. And sure enough, I went online. I found that the bills had already been introduced. I just hadn't heard of them yet. And so that's when I decided to try to fight them in the hopes that I could stay in Texas. However, it did become clear during the fight that this issue was not, not going away. And even back then in uh, 2021, when the bills, uh, the bill at least for uh, banning gender affirming medical care for minors was defeated, the parents around me said, we were here two years ago fighting the bathroom bill. This is not going away. We'll be back in another two years fighting the same bills. And I said, that is not, that is not a way to live. It's just horrible. It's, it was causing Leon stress. He had chronic stomach aches. He, he missed so much of second grade that he barely passed it. And I was stressed. You know, I didn't know what was coming next. The, the parents around me were starting to create safe folders, or I'm not even sure what they were called, but these documents in case child protective services came knocking at your door. You had evidence gathered in a folder that you're a good parent. And right. I was like, yeah, no, I'm out. I mean, so how old is Leon now? Leon is now 10. Right. Um, and I mean, I, I was in the Daily Beast interview. He was talking about how um, he loves playing basketball and <laughs> loves basketball. And one of the um, the bills that pass is a ban on trans kids participating in sports. What I mean, what does that say to your child that, right. you know, y Leon is a boy, but for some reason the state has said, well, not really a boy, and you don't get to be a part of like the social structures that your friends are a part of. I mean, what does that feel like f for him? It feels terrible, and, and in, in a way, luckily, he's, he's too young to fully articulate it, but he's not too young to feel it, and, and you, can, you can hear in the question at the time. So when we were in Texas, that was the only piece of legislation that did pass, the ban on on minor children playing on the sports team that aligned with their gender. And when that passed, he was playing on a, on a team at the Y, but it, it was a, it was a co-ed team, but still he said to me, because he doesn't understand that all the nuances then he was, he was eight at the time. He said, does that mean I don't get to play basketball? So, you know, what it means for him is that he knows that people are against him even existing. And that is, I don't understand how that's not completely devastating and paralyzing, <laughs> but he's a kid and he's resilient and he doesn't know any better. But, you know, if someone started treating me that way, I, I don't know how I would get up in the morning. I mean, can, can you talk a bit about 
your family's process as you knew that Leon was transitioning or was a boy, um, what that was like and your family's story leading up to where you had to make this decision? Right. So it was the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we were all in the house a lot together and we were just hanging out one day and I was talking to Leon's older sister about um, the importance of loving yourself. And Leon pipes up in the background and says, but I don't love myself. And that just didn't um, make sense to me as his mom. You know, I've been watching this kid be, uh, you know, super gregarious, outgoing. I called him the ambassador of the family because he would bring friends to us. You know, he was just that um, that much of the life of the party kind of personality. And you're like, how can you not love yourself? You're only seven, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, um, you know, he had already started wearing his hair short, but so did his sister but he started refusing her sparkly hand-me-downs, you know, um, the t-shirts I would buy with, you know, pink flamingos. And he was like, can you just buy me a gray t-shirt? I'm like, sure, you know. I didn't know much about uh, what it meant to be transgender. And I didn't know that uh, the children know at such a young age, you know, that, that we've assigned them the wrong gender. And so I just thought, well, someday when it's time to date, you know, you know, we'll have some issue with sexuality. And I didn't realize that it was a gender issue. And anyway, that day I asked him if he would like to see his sister's therapist and he said yes. And I was like, okay, again, this makes no sense. Why would a seven-year-old want, want to go to therapy? But he knew something was wrong. And later he told me, I just knew I wasn't who you expected me to be. And so, but in therapy, we, we both learned um, eventually about transgender um, identity and and the therapist recommended a children's book for him and he read it and a few days later he came to me and said do you think i'm and i said well it doesn't matter what i think it matters what you think i knew what he was talking about being transgender and and um and he's he couldn't talk he had a panic attack again seven years old you're, you're like watching all these things that you don't you don't expect and and I said, well, why don't I say it? And you shake your head, yes or no. And I said, do you think you're transgender? And he shook his head, yes. And in that moment, I was just like, well, okay, we'll figure it out and we'll get you what you need. <laughs> you know, that was kind of my attitude. And yeah. And, it, and um, you know, at first he, anyway, it took a, it was a process to, 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 um, to include the family in this revelation and realization and, but he took us right along really quickly, you know, by the end of the summer, this was in May, by the end of the summer, we had his new name, his new pronouns, his gender marker changed on his birth certificate. Um, everyone in our immediate circle accepted him. You know, the people who had all known him with a different name were now using the new name, our family, grandparents, everything was on, everyone was on board and everything was fine. I did take him out of the school system because I had heard, you know, that no transgender child had ever stayed in that school system because it was unwelcoming. It's not the Austin proper, but out in the hill country. And, um, and so we made that change and everything was moving fine until this legislation was introduced. And that's what people have to understand that even it being introduced is harmful. Even having this conversation, questioning someone's existence is harmful much less actually passing the bills, of course, is a whole nother level of harm. But we suffered just from being in that environment. I mean, it makes total sense. And I'm just so struck by how you speak really plainly about you just essentially responding to what your son was telling you, because so much of the anti-trans panic is focused on parental rights. What, it, what are we going to do about the parents when it's really about Parents, how are you going to treat your children with respect and agency and hear what they have to say about their lives and internalize it without rejecting it? It's just good parenting. That's the bottom line. Right. And, you know, Leon is my third child. <laughs> and of course, I've, I've made many mistakes before and I'll make many mistakes coming. <laughs> but, um, but by then, I was very clear that my children are not mini me's. They're on their own journey. Um, and I had always treated all of them, you know, uh, with respect as far as their choices, as things that they could choose, you know, how to express themselves. Were they interested in piano? Did they like fish? I mean, whatever it was, you know, I was going to encourage it. And so I, so I was actually shocked that 
here I thought I was being a parent that lets their children express themselves, that let them lets their children be who they are, gives them the space and, and the room to do that. But yet I had actually been unknowingly putting expectations on Leon that were weighing on him. He knew he wasn't living up to my expectations. And if you had asked me, I would have said, I have no expectations. But of course we do. In this society, we are we totally think in a binary way. We totally think about gender. I mean, we have gender reveal parties. I mean, yeah, you know, it's so ingrained. And 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 how we back up from that as parents and even as a society is I have no idea, <laughs> but I'm I'm here and I'm willing to help people figure it out as I figure it out. Well, I mean, I appreciate you speaking about this because it's just really helpful to hear it, hear uh, your experience. And I, I just want wanted to know if you'd be OK talking a bit about what gender affirming care looks like for Leon, because, sure. again, we combat the right wing every day on the show and it's mutilation like uh, uh, they, they post photos of surgeries as if like yeah surgery is bloody sometimes it's a little gross uh, it's that way for knee replacements it's that way for rhinoplasties um but in terms of leon's care calendar um mm -hmm. what can you tell us about that because it, it i think that might be helpful for people to understand sure so I happened to be at a comedy show <laughs> this past weekend in DC, and it tells you how mainstream the issue of transgender identity has become, that the comic was making jokes about transgender. But in his show, he said something to the effect of giving hormones to three-year-olds. I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> right. I understand needing to be funny, but that's not funny. <laughs> it wasn't funny to me because it's so inaccurate. And so, so what gender-affirming care looks like at the beginning is um, basically social transition. So it's allowing the child to change their hairstyle, their their clothing styles, use different pronouns, you know, that sort of thing. It's completely social. At some point, well, right before puberty, that basically if, if you have the care you need, your physician is monitoring your child for signs of puberty. When they do start to show signs of puberty, then you have the decision and the discussion um, whether to start puberty blockers so that the child does not go through uh, changes in their body that will be very upsetting to them um, and actually is, is a medical diagnosis of body dysmorphia. And this is just where you feel uncomfortable in your skin and those kinds of changes would be really upsetting. And so um, when those changes do occur, the physician, the, the counselor or a therapist, the parents, even the child, you know, get together and say, here's, here are your options. You know, what do we do? And so for Leon, we all decided together that puberty blockers would be the way to go. These are reversible. Yep. Um, they give the child and the family more time to figure out, are, are we on the right track here with your gender identity? Do you feel comfortable this way, you know, you know, it's, it's a question and, and we always want to leave room, you know, for, for different answers. And so the puberty blockers give us a time and the space to do that. And so that's what he's on now. Eventually it'll be time, you know, in the teenage years to switch to hormone therapy in which he would get testosterone. If we decide that, not everyone has to do that. Everyone's path is different. I'm not, this is not like you jump on the, on the train and then you can't get off. You can get yeah. off anytime. We do not do surgery. Nobody does surgery. Surgery is not the standard of care for minors. So, so that just tells you right there, anyone who's talking about that and knows better is just trying to scare you. We don't, I mean, anyway, I'm not even going to say the words, but, but um, it's just not standard of care. It yes. may be prescribed very late in the teen years for someone who really has severe dysmorphia. If, if, if it's a matter between this person staying alive and, and having some kind of surgery, mostly that would be top surgery. I would, and, and even less common would be any kind of bottom surgery really is after 18. I mean, it really is. And, I mean, I'm not a medical doctor, but this is my understanding as a parent who has done the research. But but please, you know, I'm not trying to be an expert, but I am trying to say from, from where I sit, surgery is very rare. 
No, well, I mean, everything that I've uh, researched in my time, you know, covering the news is every your the calendar that you describe is exactly what the standard of care is. Um, And again, these right wingers don't talk about breast augmentations, which happen underage, breast reductions, which which happen underage, which is equivalent to a top surgery. And even that Mm -hmm. is happening in incredibly rare instances. Um, Mm -hmm. And so and a ban on on gender affirming care um, in practice, I mean, that is just going to increase levels of gender dysphoria, as you describe Mm -hmm. gender dysphoria, which would have and, and has documented to have incredibly negative mental health effects and is a really big part of increased suicidal attempt Mm -hmm. and suicidal ideation rates among trans kids because they're unable to socially transition in the way or or, uh, that that fits best with their vision for themselves this is just about empowering children and and families to determine this kind of calendar of care for those kids Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think everyone can identify with the fact that they would like their insides to match their outsides. I mean, everyone chooses a hairstyle. Everyone chooses their their wardrobe. You know, the, everyone chooses how to express themselves, even in whether they play the piano or they play sports. You know, children. Everyone should have that right. Yeah. Lastly, uh, before I let you go. You, you've moved to the, the, the D.C. area, right? Um, I guess you've already made that, that move, right? Um, yes. You're at, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I wonder if you could reflect on other families in your position who might not have the ability <laughs> to move and, and what, what, what that really means for... I know it was a, an easy decision for you, and I, I, I understand that it's just there's going to be a lot more people who are going to be forced to make that choice. What's your message to them? And, and, and if it's not workable for them, right. you know, how, how does that go? <laughs> so I just want to clarify, there's two things. There's, there's a difference between it was an easy decision and whether the process itself right. has been easy, which it has not. It has been, it has been soul crushing to be honest. And, it, and it's still ongoing. And, and, you know, I'm not in Texas near my family as they age and, and pass away, you know, weddings and funerals, you know, I mean, there's, and, and, and issues that come up in my life where I wish they were closer to me, you know, health scares or whatever, you know, so it hasn't been easy. And um, for the people who can't leave, I can't tell you how much that weighs on me. And which is why I say yes to all these interviews because they can't speak. They cannot speak out for fear of being targeted politically physically you know it's it's terrible and 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 it and it makes me angry that that happens in our country i mean we talk about free speech they don't have free speech right now right yeah it's it's an incredibly scary time um i'm glad you were able to to make this move and you're i mean a a great mom so thank you camille i really appreciate your time and, and taking the time to tell us a little bit about your family today yeah anytime